Hello, I'm, uh, I'm about my, what my subject was. It says complexity, yeah, but it's actually dealing with complexity, or reducing complexity. Uh, this is my fourth and last talk here at uh, this um, summer camp. Uh, and I've had kind of a meta point with the, the, the presentations I've been doing. Uh, and that meta point is that form and content are intimately connected. So when I talk about the history of live role-playing, which is constituted very much by anecdotes, I show a bit of video, a bit of photo, and a bit of timelines to make an overview. When I'm talking about 1942, there's no text on the screen. It's a personal story, so I tell a personal story, and it's a visual game, so I show images. Uh, we're talking about character design, which is often very much about the writing, and it's important for me to have text up there. And then I was going to talk about reducing complexity. And then I sit down and I realize I have 30 slides full of text. And that's not very, that's like not, there's a bit of complexity in 30 slides full of text. Uh, so what I've done is that I have condensed everything important from those 30 slides into a single slide. And I'm only going to show it once, now at the very beginning. So those of you who want to take notes uh, should be prepare your notebooks now. Uh, or, for, or cameras and so on, because this one slide contains everything you need to remember from this whole one hour, hour lecture. Okay, so are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay, show the slide. <laughs> Let's okay, then we finish with the slideshow. <laughs> Less is more. And what I'm going to talk about now is why and how. So, we are human beings. We drink and we piss. We eat and we shit. We grow older. If we're lucky, we get to fuck. Some of us, as a result of fucking, might have children. <laughs> who then eat, drink, piss, shit, maybe fuck and have children of their own. And then, at some point, we die. And that's it, looking at human life from the outside, objectively. That's all there is to it, really. Birth, death, and some stuff in between. <laughs> of course, looking at this from the inside, as human beings, there's a whole lot more going on. Now, very early in our lives, we learn to point at something, like this here. And we learn to utter a sound. Floor. And suddenly, this sound is equivalent of that thing, indicative of that thing, signifies that. But it doesn't just signify this floor, no, floor, it also signifies that floor, and another floor, and a floor I've never seen. And I meet someone else, in kindergarten or in summer camp, and they don't say floor, they say gulv, or what's this floor in Russian? Ball. Ball. Ball, yeah. And then we learn that this sound and that sound have the same signification. And then we attach these words to other things. We have that itchy feeling inside, those butterflies in the stomach, that special things that ha happens when you look at a special person. And we call that love. But we also have the feeling of sitting, uh, sitting at home late at night, uh, holding hands, reading a book, nothing big going on, and we call that too love. We look, at, look into the eyes of our child, uh, our child, our child and our family, and that feeling there we also call love. And we have stretched this word to have a million different meanings. And we make photos, and we paint paintings, and we sing songs that express these emotions and contain in themselves all these different meanings. And we translate between the media. We write a book and we play a song at the same time. And going from the individual experience, individual language, uh, we use these words, this language, to talk to other people, to agree, to do stuff, to order each other around. And we build families, we build uh, societies, we build nations, we build history, we record it, we analyze it. We make, uh, we make moments of astounding beauty, we make uh, acts of, uh, of astonishing morality and self-sacrifice, and we do the opposite. We hurt each other, we grow jealous, we hate. And all of these things are contained in human experience. Now, I personally, I tend to think of live role-playing as the ultimate for art form. Or maybe if it's not an art form, if the established art forms disagree, then it's something even better than art. And it's the ultimate art form because, unlike all the other art forms, it can condense and communicate the whole breadth of human experience, from how we build societies to that little moment by the fireplace at night. All of life, all of the human experience, and communicated directly. 
I'm not seeing somebody else experience of this moment. I am experiencing it myself. And I can do all of these things, say a couple of things that are biologically troublesome to simulate, such as, for example, childbirth or death. We still can't deal with those. Maybe someday with super advanced virtual reality equipment we can, but that's not now. So LARP can deal with all of this stuff, but just because it can does not mean it should. If we try to make a LARP that contains in itself every possible social structure, every possible form of communication, every possible language, every possible human relationship, every possible stage of life, every possible meaning of different words, then we end up with a LARP that is incredibly difficult to play, or enormously huge. The LARP that goes on for five years and requires a, a, a whole nation state to produce. And this is basically impossible. So we have to slice it down. We have to find smaller moments, smaller things, focus down on something that can contain what we want to communicate as LARP directors. Less is more. Now, one of the most common ways we human beings deal with all these moments, all these words and impressions and emotions that go through our lives is that we tell stories about them. Right now, standing here, I'm telling a story. I'm using a storytelling technique to communicate something. What I'm talking about is actually ideas uh, and logical structures and so on, but I'm stor storytelling. If I go up to you and ask, so what do you do for a living? I am actually asking you to tell a story about yourself. Because what do you do for a living? You do a million different things every day. You brush your teeth, that's part of your life, but you don't tell me about that. You edit, you highlight, you make arcs, structures. Now let me tell you a story about uh, one of my first experiences as a LARP organizer. Uh, you saw a little bit of video of the AIC that experienced this and the LARP uh, on the first day here. The LARP was Kibbe Genesis, it was 1997. Uh, it was the biggest production I've ever been involved in. I've never done anything the same size since, which you will soon understand why. 110 players, a shutdown mental asylum, five days, um, enormous amounts of poop that had been moved out of the room, uh, cold and freezing players, and inside this mental asylum we recreated a totalitarian society as taken out of George Orwell's 1984. And as mentioned, I was uh, young, I was not very experienced as a LARP designer, but I had this like need that, yeah, we've got to do this LARP and it's going to be awesome. And then I'm there at the pre-brief. And the pre-brief is really, I think, maybe the most important moment in a LARP's life. You have all the planning phases beforehand, and you can, you can spend a lot of time planning. And then you have the LARP itself, and you can't really control it that much. The single most critical moment is the moment you have all the players there in the room with you, and you're telling them what's going to happen now. I've noticed later that like, any little deviation from your plans in the pre-brief can have huge consequences on the game. At one, at one LARP, I forgot to introduce an important character. Uh, I just talked about, like, okay, there are five characters here that I need to talk about, and I talk about four of them, and I forget the, fourth, the fifth one. And then during the game, he dies, and nobody cares. And this moment, the moment of this character's death, is defining for the LARP. I give an example. Like, uh, there was a Swedish LARP, uh, uh which had 1,000 players, and it, in the background material it said, you have to make up a background story for your character. For example, Maybe you are from a village that was plundered by orcs and your parents were killed. And that's your backstory. This play, LARP had 1,000 players and it has been estimated that 500 of them came from villages that had been plundered by orcs and were orphans as a result. Uh, those who work a lot with, with theatre uh, or with psychological games know that we are very suggestible people. Uh, once we begin communicating uh, an idea, uh, such as, okay, uh, orc burning villages is something that happens in it, this world. Then people begin uh, working from that idea onwards. Every single thing you say in a pre-brief uh, has this effect of shaping your players' expectations of the law. So there I am, at my first biggest, most important pre-brief. And I go through the facts about the law, and things go reasonably well. And I'm asking the players, uh, so, are there any questions? And these are awesome players, they're marvellous players, they have a, a huge job with uh, costuming, and they're really engaged. Uh, and they haven't had much, to, much material, a bit of uh, background information, and a short title about who their character is and where he is in the hierarchy. And I ask them for questions. So I get one question. Yeah, uh, I had heard there was going to be a TV system here. Uh, where, where is that? Uh, televisions, yeah, okay, uh, that's, uh, that's Alan's uh, responsibility. Uh, okay. Alan isn't here right now, he's probably out there fixing the television, so I'll have to come back to that, okay? 
Yeah, food. What will we eat? Uh, we've got some food, I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, let me see. Nils, you were responsible for food, right? Um, uh, okay, Nils isn't here either. Okay. I'll have to delay that question a bit. Um, and then somebody asks, uh, I haven't gotten my full character. When do I get that one? And I'm like, aha, I'm the guy responsible for the full characters. I can answer this question. And I look at my pile of papers and I realize I haven't gotten his character because I've been so busy worrying about everything else that, uh, that I didn't finish his character. And I'm like, uh, sorry, but uh, I'll have to give it to you later. And another player asks, but what my character? Whoops, <laughs> not that one either. And another one, what about my character? No, not that one either. Are there any characters in your pile, Mr. Fatlan? Not really. <laughs> Just please go off and role play. The LARP has begun. And then I go to a fantasy LARP for a few days. And I come back. And there are only maybe 10 of the 100 players left. And they stopped role playing a day ago because it just didn't work. They're barbecuing hot dogs instead. And it's at this point I wake up and realize that it had all been a nightmare. There's still a month left to the LARP. Now, this kind of nightmare is fairly common amongst LARP designers. I've heard a guy uh, claim that uh, if you don't have those kind of nightmares, you're not any good as a LARP designer. <laughs> uh, I'll give you another example of an organized nightmare. And uh, I've asked Alan to assist me a bit here. There's a friend of ours who, um, who had this dream where she came to the LARP and it had already started to play, uh, running, and the players were there. And they role played like this. Uh, and they just, they were trying really hard. They, they were, but the, the organizers hadn't given them enough to play on. They just really couldn't, you know, come up with anything stronger. <laughs> and so what do we do when we have these fears, because these are very common organizer fears. What I did with Kid Genesis is I started going into panic mode and I over -designed. I added stuff to the fiction that hadn't been there before. Okay, yeah, so there's this dark depressive thing, but it's also it's science fiction. Let's add some, add some mad professors, some crazy scientists, and let's have a big dramatic plot that culminates on the last day of the LARP where they all learn that they're going to be replaced by robots. Yeah, okay, this will create more drama in the LARP, right? And it did, it created lots of drama in the LARP. And I think actually the, the professors, the crazy professors were kind of fun. Uh, but after LARP, I talked to a player who's like, okay, this, this has been really great. Thank you so much. I've had like one of the most interesting experiences of my lifetime. But I really hated the last day when this whole thing about us being re replaced by robots came in. Because I have been playing low-key. I've been just going around, carrying coffee to people, and living this miserable little life for four days. And that was my play experience. And I would have wanted to leave it exactly there, with the knowledge that this character's life goes on inside this world, which is plausible and coherent. And then instead, I come in and throw like some robot plot on top of them. I've seen other organizers responding to the organizer nightmares by in adding extra content, more and more content, longer characters. And it kills play. At this point in the creative process, you just really need to trust your original instincts and think that, no, what a few months ago I thought was going to carry the law, what I thought was good enough material to role play on, will still carry. It's just now, at this point, I have become blind. I think over-design is the second most common mistake committed by lot designers. The most common is uneven design. That is, you have 20, 20 characters and you actually only have content for five of them. The 15 other are uh, movie extras. There's a lot to be said about how to fix those kind of problems. I'm not going to go into it here because that's complex. I'm going to talk about simplicity. But I think the second most common problem is over-design, throwing too much stuff in. And the problem with over-design is that if I'm both having a meta-technique here, and if I'm having, uh, if I'm having like uh, 15 different relations are all trying to get to me now, and I have a goal, three goals that the organizers have given me that I have to pursue right now, then I'm not actually doing anything. I'm just trying to navigate between all the different play possibilities. And while I'm doing that, that character over there was really dependent on me, my character, and this one relationship to get her game to work she falls out and she doesn't have anything to do. As players, we are amazingly creative people. 
we have full idea as an initiative once we get onto the notion of role play, once we get started. The first five minutes of Anilov are always <coughs> awkward. They're always a bit like, how do we get into this and how do we role play? But then it goes pretty much by itself. As our LARP rights as designers, it's our job not to kill that initiative, but to direct it in interesting ways. Now we've learned all about the mixing table of LARP. I think there are only a couple of sliders left. The thing with a mixing table, uh, if you use it for sound or if you use it for light, uh, is that you very rarely have all the, all the sliders up to full. Now, if I'm a light technician and I put all the sliders on the rock bands above the full, there's just this blinding light and I can't see the bloody band. And if I'm a sound technician, I've asked Alan to demonstrate uh, for us here what happens when the sound technician turns the sliders to full. Okay, one slider going up a little bit. We have beautiful music. And a second thing in between. This is getting interesting. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, it gets a bit much, doesn't it? Now, if you have ever attempted to do a lot that like has all of the sliders in the mixing table turned to full, remember that sound. Now, another crucial moment in the lifetime of LARP is a pitch. The moment you convince people to play your LARP. And if, they have been, if they're a classroom and they've been ordered to play in your LARP, the pitch is whatever you say when you introduce your LARP to begin with. Now, I'll give you two pitches. The first pitch comes from my uh, alter ego, um, Gilbert Krag, pretentious LARP organizer. Hello. I would like you to invite you to a LARP. It happens in a cottage in the woods. It is about a group of teenagers. They are on a holiday. They are dealing with issues of growing up, anxiety, and managing emotions and relationships, as well as the meaning of life. Thank you. Now I'll introduce you to my other friend, the LARP writer, Peter Populist. Hello. I'd like to invite you to my LARP. It happens in a cottage in the forest. It's about a bunch of teenagers who are on, on a holiday trip to this cottage. And while they're on this cottage, they're going to deal with issues of like anxiety and emotions and growing up and the meaning of life while they're fighting zombies. <laughs> now, these two lobs are actually very similar. Which lob do you think would get the most players? The second yeah. one. Uh, Johanna Pettersson, a Finnish uh, lob designer, calls this the necessary zombie. He claims that every lob should have a zombie. Uh, because people need uh, easily relatable content. Something they personally can relate to, and, and that makes them enthusiastic about uh, participating in the LARP. Now, uh, how many people here like, really like zombie movies? Could you raise a, raise a hand? Yeah, as I suspect, it's not, it's not everybody, right? <laughs> so maybe not everybody would go to the second LARP. Uh, you know, maybe uh, there are a lot of people who are really fans of the literature of uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky. And let's say that uh, Gilbert Krag again pitches this LARP that we are going to do a LARP about the young Fyodor Dostoevsky before he becomes famous and becomes a writer and his friends at a cottage in the woods dealing with blah, 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 blah. You know, then maybe this is a very interesting LARP to play. Fyodor Dostoevsky can also be a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> So your zombie may vary. But the thing is, if we look at this from a player perspective, if I have read, uh, I've read personally a lot of uh, Ibsen, a uh, Norwegian playwright. If I go to a LARP that says this is an Ibsen LARP, then I have a pretty good idea of how to behave in it. Ibsen's characters are often quite stiff and a bit bourgeois. So the moment we begin role playing, I'll be quite stiff and a bit bourgeois. I'll wait until the host says, please eat. Uh, I'll speak language a certain way, and I know there is room at times to come with passionate speeches about morality or about personal issues. 
All of this I know just because the organism doesn't call it an Ibsen bar. Now if I go to a zombie larp, I know that I should better begin looking for a shotgun or a crowbar. And it's okay to play really scared as well as really aggressive. How we market the LARP, how we pitch it, tells people more than just what this LARP is going to be about. It tells them how they play at the LARP. By the word zombie, I have told you that every zombie book you have seen, every zombie book you have read is relevant to this LARP. By saying Ibsen, I'm saying that everything you know about Ibsen is relevant to how you're going to role-play during at the LARP. And at the LARP, we're role-playing, we're improvising, we're making decisions da, 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 all the time. You know, every single sentence, every moment where I'm looking is a decision. And you don't sit around and think through those decisions. Hmm, I think it would be most appropriate right now for my character, given what was in the character description, that I run away screaming. Yes, I'll do that. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. We take sudden, spontaneous decisions. And actually, a lot of this, this subconscious material that these decisions come from, come from our understanding of what I call the interaction code of the law. How everything is connected. And that understanding usually comes from our understanding of the genre, the style of interaction, the way you're being, the appropriate stories that can happen at this law. Now, how do you find a LARP idea that actually works? You know, how, do you, how do you identify a genre that will appeal to people, or a, a word, or a reference? I mean, it doesn't have to be about genre. You can also talk about, uh, like, there's a popular Norwegian LARP, which is about a family dinner before Christmas. And that's all there is. It's just an ordinary family before Christmas. And it's popular because everybody has been to a family dinner before Christmas, and they find them a bit awkward and a bit silly. And everybody knows some uncle who's a bit weird, and some aunt who talks too much and drinks too much sherry or something. And they can take all of this stuff into role-playing, and it's fun. And they see that once we say it's a lot about the Norwegian family at dinner. So it doesn't have to be zombies or Ibsen or Dostoevsky. It can be something from your own life. But how do you figure out whether this is something that actually appeals to players? And you should care about the appeal to players, even if you're doing educational LARPs, or LARPs of uh, societal value, especially if you're doing educational LARPs and people are forced to play them, because you really need them to get engaged. What I do personally, I mean, there are probably a million different methods to it, but what I do is I start talking very loudly about my ideas to anyone who will listen. You know, I have this idea of this lock, which will be like a bunch of people who are just sitting around waiting for five hours. And then people look at me like, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good idea, Eric. Yeah, so what I was saying about the football match was, uh, okay, and then I'm kind of, okay, maybe not, this doesn't appeal to those people. Then I talk to someone else and they have this idea of like, a game that's about waiting for five hours. Waiting for five hours, you say? Hmm, I wonder what would happen then. I realize, okay, I might have at least one player here. But I probably will not get 100 players to go to this game. And probably if people are forced to participate in it, they have to be very, very careful because they probably won't, most of them won't like it. And then I come along with another idea, like uh, a bunch of teenagers in the cottage and zombies. And there are a lot of people that are saying, yeah, ha, I'd play that. That's good. And then I know, okay, now I have something. And maybe sometimes they say, okay, yeah, so a bunch of teenagers in the cottage and, and zombies, right? Uh, yeah, that, that means it's, it's kind of, uh, that means it's going to be like uh, the movie Dawn of the Dead. And I'm like, I have never, no idea what you mean. I've never seen that movie. Okay, I better research this because other players are going to expect this. Um, and by doing all this checking, talking, 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 pitching, 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 I also tend to end up with an organizer group. Other people who feel like, yeah, I think this, this idea is so good, I want to be part of making it real. Or I can threaten them. Oh, you really want to play this LARP? Well, it's not going to happen if you don't help me. <laughs> now, the thing is, uh, I mean, as I said the first, uh, in the first lecture, I'm, uh, I'm a silly amateur when it comes to LARP. My only, claim to, uh, my only claim to fame is that I've been doing this for a long time and have a very big mouth. Uh, in my real life, I play the role of an interaction designer. And I have played the character of a design school student for five and a half years. In other words, I'm a bit of a professional creative. I work with creative stuff every day. And what I've noticed about professional creatives, whether they're writers or theater directors or photographers or whatever, is that there are some tricks we learn during those educations that LARP designers also need and sometimes have inherently. One very big trick is to treat ideas as building blocks, but never as something personal. And I had that beaten out of me the hard way. First year in design school, when we're drawing three-dimensional drawings, and I'm working very hard at this, and suddenly the teacher comes over and picks up my, my beautiful drawing, my hard work, 
and he shows you the class and he says, everybody look here. <coughs> this is shit. This is total absolute crap. And throws it to the ground and walks on. Of course, I mean, I, I am not condoning this as a method of teaching, just to be clear. <coughs> Uh, but it did teach me one very useful lesson, and that was not to get too attached to my own ideas. This was just matter. It was just lines, lines on a piece of paper. It was not me. The only way this teacher could hurt me was if I think that those lines of paper are me. My ideas are not me. Ideas are something that bounce around in a whole, a whole group of people. And professional ed creatives really care about the good idea. They care about the good execution. When the idea has been realized, when it has been combined. And to be critical of your own ideas, is, uh, it's a difficult skill. But the best way to do so is to have a bunch of ideas, lots of ideas, and then select amongst them. You don't have to achieve every single idea you have on a, on a given block. Select the ones that work the best. Less is more. Now, I showed you uh, the presentation about the law of 1942. In my opinion, it's one of the probably best locks ever designed, but it had a couple of flaws. One flaw was that we did not have a proper pre-debrief after the game, and really we should have spent two days just talking through what does this game mean for us. The other flaw was the uh, uh, material we got as players before the game. Uh, it was a pile of books about this thick, some uh, three to five hundred pages of text, and it was very condensed text. It was like, uh, you know, if you're a student and you get like this pile of curriculum uh, and then uh, you browse through it and you take notes. It was, like, it was like the notes, not like the books. Everything you ever wanted to know about World War II history. Everything you wanted to know about this particular area and so on. So I remember I found a very good joke in one of, uh, one of the books, like a locally flavored period specific joke. And it was that there was the official one krona bill, that's uh, the money, and it was called uh, Entschlink which I'll just translate as a jerk. So, yeah, uh, how much does that cost? It costs a jerk. And then you play, pay with the one krona bill. And then it was also a two krona bill. And that one was called a quisling. <laughs> a quisling was the dictator, or the fascist dictator of Norway at the time. So the joke inherent in this was like, uh, quisling is double a jerk. Or you need two jerks to make a quisling. <laughs> And I thought, oh, this is a great joke. I'm going to use this during role playing. So at some point, when we're sitting in Attic, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I'm, I'm talking about, and then the store owner said that, oh, this will cost, a, cost you a quisling. And my co players look at me like, huh? Because amongst the four or five hundred pages of text, they hadn't read that particular one in the same level of detail as I had. <laughs> they had read other pages of text much more, right? So uh, the third most common. The design mistake I see a lot of, uh, lot of designers make is information overload. And that was exactly what these uh, huge bounds <coughs> of, of the text were. And the problem with information overload, because we can always say that players can do their own research, they can filter the information, they can choose what's relevant. But if, I, if what I think is relevant is different than what you think is relevant, then we have a problem in the game. Then we can't use it to role play on. It's only the information we share that is actually playable. So when it comes to information, when it comes to text, uh, less is more. Slice it down. I have one example of uh, how we worked with this in uh, one group. Uh, the Mafia musical I talked about earlier. Um, it was a game where you can kind of just come and pay the ticket and play. So no time for preparations. We really couldn't send people like booklets in advance. Uh, so we wrote down everything we needed to tell people about the game. Uh, and uh, uh, this game was kind of anarchistically organized, so we had like several workshops and then people would just drop by and then they would help us write characters for a few hours and then they would disappear again with no responsibility. Uh, so there were lots of people in and out of the project and it was okay. So we first, the two uh, main organizers, we sit down and we write down everything we need to tell people and we have somebody drop by and we, we tell this to them. And it takes 90 minutes. And we had hoped to get it down to around an hour. In addition, they have lots and lots of questions. Okay, so we sit down and we rewrite it. We cut some stuff that we found wasn't really that important. And then there's the stuff they ask lots of questions about. And we find ways to get rid of it. We change the game concept in some cases so that we won't get so many questions about this. And then we're down to 60 minutes and somebody else comes in and we do the same thing again. 
and we get some more questions, and uh, we ask questions afterwards to check if they've understood it, and we cut again. And in the end, we're down to something like 20 to 30 minutes, including dancing exercises. And now we have really efficient communication. Now we have the less while we started with the more. But some of the time we spent on, uh, a lot of the time we spent talking was about meta techniques. Because again, I mean, this was something I helped design uh, a year ago. You know, I'm, I'm, this isn't my second laugh, this is my uh, 15th laugh as a designer. I should have known better, right? But again, I went in and over-designed it. <laughs> because we were still unsure, okay, do they have enough to play on, you know? We don't really know how this is going to look in play, so... Yeah, let's have this meta technique as a fallback in case people can't, can't figure out how to play, or somebody's bored, and let's have this one as well, and this one. And in the end, we have something like six different meta techniques. And then we play the game, and only three of them are used. We play the game again, and only three of them are used. And by the third time we play the game, we stop talking about the other meta techniques. Thankfully, people didn't use them, because if some people had been using them and other people had forgotten them, we would have had a real problem in the game. It would be dysfunctional. So meta techniques is maybe the area where you have to be the most careful about avoiding complexity and really focus on less is more. And you can achieve a lot more with one effective meta technique than you can achieve with like a hundred not so effective meta techniques. Sonography has also been touched on. Uh, the thing with uh, sonography, like when you choose to do minimalist sonography, you don't want to change the room much. You don't want to bother about sonography, you just want to play. The tricky thing about sonography is that if you go into a room, if you go to, into a classroom, for example, it's not minimalist. There's stuff there, there's a blackboard, there's chairs, there's tables. If you're going to go in there and play a game about boring family dinner, they are surrounded by a school. And we perceive this subconsciously, if not consciously. If we want a really minimalist sonography, if you really want a boring family dinner in a classroom, and we want this to be as effective as possible on the players, we need to get rid of all the tables and chairs and cover up the blackboard. Because the blackboard is all the time reminding you that you're in school. Also in sonography, less is more. And I think it was pointed out uh, by a previous speaker that once you have an empty room, whatever you put in the room becomes incredibly powerful. If you want a church at the lock, there's no point kind of trying to bring in the church organ and hang up the religious tapestries and the incense uh, and the altar and so on. No, if you get rid of everything and you put a single cross up on the wall, that is a very, very holy room, that very second. If you add all the stuff, maybe it becomes less churchy. Maybe you get the problem that now you don't have the stained glass windows, it doesn't look real anymore. So also when it comes to sonography, I think less is more. Uh, yeah, okay. That hat. I noticed it because the rest of the, the rest of the floor was empty. See, that was the point. Okay, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost done here. It's just one final reflection. Because the LARP I played in 1942 uh, of the five refugees hidden in the attic, it was actually originally not a part of 1942. It had been conceived of as a separate game, one that would be played in an attic in Oslo, not in the West Coast, in the midst of a 20th century, uh, 21st century city. And the organizers would just be on the outside and they would make sounds and so on uh, for those of us inside. Uh, so the entire outside world would be um, simulated. And this in a way is less is more, a single idea taken to its fullest without the other disturbing ideas, right? But that idea was never cool enough that we managed to turn it into a LARP. When it came to 1942, and we integrated this with a whole set of other pieces of the puzzle, uh, the village, the German camp, the fishermen, uh, the boats, the whole location, then it became a full LARP. But of course, it was really important for this idea to work, that all the other pieces of the puzzle also worked and also fit together. So in some cases, I'm going to contradict myself and contradict the whole slide I presented to begin with. In some cases, more is more. But, in the 90s, when I started working with LARP in Norway, we had this idea that a real LARP has at least 50 players, and it lasts at least five days, and it's definitely not in the city, it's in the forest, so you also need to have 
Uh, you have, need to have toilets for people and food and fireplaces and water and hygiene, all of that, right? So doing a LARP was really hard work. It was a big project. It takes a year to make a LARP, right? And then when we have a LARP with 50 players, 100 players, 150 players, we have lots of different groups, we have lots of different plots, many different designers with their own ideas, their own writing styles and so on. And it became really hard to learn from these LARPs. Something goes wrong. This group over there is really bored. Well, is it because of that group design? Because of this story? Because of that group design? Because of the location they were at? It's really hard to untangle and, and kind of explain why was this group bought. It's much, much easier to learn and develop as a lab designer when you work in a small format, with a single idea, a single meta technique, a single group. And from there, once you manage to get this group to work, this meta technique to get strength uh, from being there alone, then try combining them. Two groups meet. And one hour becomes two hours, becomes a day, and so on. And so still, even though I think more sometimes is more, I want you to remember from this presentation that less is more. Thank you. I think I have time for questions. Yeah. I'm not sure this is the kind of talk you ask questions after, but uh, if you have any or comments or whatever, go ahead. No, that does not seem to be the case then. Thank you for listening. Okay.